The Souls games are a collection of games developed by From Software and the mastermind that is Miyazaki, the creative director behind the games and an icon in the games industry. I think most of you are already familiar with Dark Souls by now, especially after the release of Elden Ring, but if you're not, here's a quick rundown. The Souls games are action RPG games known for their challenging gameplay, unique storytelling, gorgeous locations, and crazy boss fights. They even spawned their own genre called Souls-likes, based on their incredible success and captivating formula. Today I want to dive into what makes the games, and more specifically Dark Souls 1, so incredibly addicting to play, despite their punishing nature and try to define what makes a Souls game feel like a Souls game. I'd like to mention that this is simply my own opinion and perspective as a game designer. I'd love to hear what you personally think about the franchise in the comments below. While your typically game will usually take you through an often lengthy and slow tutorial teaching you how to jump, how to pick up herbs, how to turn them into health potions, etc, they often focus on giving you a safe arena to learn and become comfortable with the game before proceeding. Meanwhile in Dark Souls. The Souls games on the other hand will usually throw you into a cage filled with enemies, force you to fight your way out, and sometimes even find a way to defend yourself along the way before throwing a boss battle that's usually unbeatable in your face, all just during the tutorial area. This is pretty much what happens during the Dark Souls 1 prologue as you make your way through the Northern Undead Asylum. While this might seem like a ridiculous way to teach someone how to play your game, it's structured in a way that lets you intuitively pick up on mechanics and learn by simply trying things yourself. Not only does this way of learning feel rewarding and inspiring to the player, but it also sets the tone for the rest of the game and what the player can expect. You're instantly given a clear message that this game won't be holding your hand as you play, and that you may need to face challenges a few times, or even a few hundred times, before you find a way to progress. Other players can also guide you by leaving messages, which are confined to a set of words the developers have predetermined. These can sometimes be helpful, and other times they're just straight up troll messages by other players wanting to see you fall to your death for the hundredth time. This mentality of figure it out yourself has to me at least become part of the magic that makes these games so unique, as many other games these days are often catered to a casual audience. The Souls games want you to die, and you will die. A lot. Every time you die, your souls are dropped at the location of your death, and you have one chance to recover them. If you die again before recovering them, they're gone forever. Souls are what's used as your experience points to level up, and used as your currency to purchase new items and upgrade your gear, so it's safe to say that losing these are less than ideal. On top of that, you can only save your progress at bonfires, which allow you to rest and recover up your Estus flasks. Estus flasks are consumables that function as potions and are your primary source of healing as you play. Now these recharge upon reaching your next bonfire, which is crucial as it allows the player to feel comfortable using them while still maintaining a sense of scarcity in their resources. Now you might be thinking, how on earth does this equate to a positive experience? Well, it's all about encouraging growth and overcoming challenges. This is a huge part of what makes the Souls games so rewarding. I can safely say that almost every time I die in Dark Souls, I feel like I learned something new. Once I respawn back in my previous bonfire, my second attempt at traversing an area or fighting a boss is a little easier as my newfound knowledge gives me better odds of survival. I know where the traps are, where the sneaky guy who's gonna stab me in the back comes from, I may even have opened up a shortcut to get back to where I was even quicker. While it's certainly punishing and can occasionally be frustrating to die in a Souls game, it never feels unfair, and I always pick up more information on the enemies I face, the paths I take, or the boss I'm fighting. All of this contributes to the incredible sense of satisfaction you get from, say, discovering a new bonfire after just barely surviving through a brutal area. Or, beating a boss with just a sliver of health remaining after having tried it 50 times and learning every single attack and movement pattern he has, perfectly dodging your way throughout the fight and finally taking it out. Another thing the Souls games excel at is the level design. This is especially true for Dark Souls 1, which has been crowned the king of world design by many. Each level is carefully handcrafted and designed to be immersive with a sense of place, history, and purpose, often featuring multiple paths to explore. Dark Souls makes you want to check every single nook and cranny. Not only are the environments absolutely breathtaking visually, but the game also features some of the best level design I have ever seen in a video game. 
The level design links between the Firelink Shrine, Undead Parish, and Undead Burg in Dark Souls 1 showcase an unprecedented level design experience. The more you explore, the more you'll find that you connect back to the same areas with new routes to take. An example of this would be kicking down the ladder in Undead Burg, letting you quickly move between the two key areas of the game, without having to walk all the way back and fighting all the same enemies again. You'll also often be able to visually see places you are about to visit or have visited in the past just by looking around in your environment. Additionally, there's a plethora of optional areas to traverse, where you'll find everything from NPCs to interact with, consumables and equipment to help you along your way, and even optional mini-bosses. Upon arriving in Firelink Shrine, you're immediately faced with multiple choices of paths to take. Each path takes you to a different area, all of which have different difficulties. You'll of course also find a few bosses along the way, such as the iconic Taurus Demon fight in Undead Parish, which is your first real boss fight encounter after the prologue. Even the boss fight has its own creative design in which you utilize the area by climbing up a ladder to eliminate two undead snipers before dropping down in the Taurus Demon's head and dealing massive damage with your weapon. This battle is clever because neglecting the snipers will still let you take down the boss, but it'll be much harder as you're being shot at by crossbows. Additionally, the ability to climb up the ladder and plunge attack onto the boss makes the boss a lot easier, whereas if you try and fight it just on the bridge, you're gonna have a tough time beating him. This makes the boss almost feel like a sort of puzzle that you have to piece together. What makes the game feel so unique in terms of its level design itself is the way everything slowly connects. You find yourself opening up shortcuts between areas, linking areas together in a way that truly feels unique to the Souls games. Everything is interconnected one way or another, and often you don't even realize until you loop back with a newly unlocked shortcut or key. As a result of this, many areas also have multiple entry points. A good example of this would be Blight Town, which actually has three different ways to enter the area, either through the Depths, the Valley of the Drakes, or by using the Master Key starting item to open a locked gate. This is part of what makes Dark Souls so much fun to explore as you're constantly connecting areas together. A lot of the environments are also just visually stunning. There are really some truly magical areas in Dark Souls, one example being An Orlando, which will have players going from badass sword-wielding murder machines to hobby photographers in seconds. There's something so incredibly breathtaking about some of the areas in these games that all of your frustrations from the past hours of brutal combat fades in a flash. The art style, lighting, and sound design all combine to create worlds that feel immersive, but suddenly all you care about is exploring the area and learning more about the lore of the lands. Speaking of lore, storytelling in the Souls games is not straightforward or linear. It's almost like a puzzle that you have to carefully solve by picking up on subtle dialogue clues, reading item descriptions, and finding NPCs around the world to converse with. You'll get a few cutscenes throughout the game, but they only tell a fraction of the story. To understand the full picture, you'll have to pick apart layers of symbolism, metaphors, and ambiguity. It really requires a keen eye and an open mind to uncover. The storytelling also creates a sense of mystery and intrigue as you never know what's going to happen next. The player must explore the game world, talk to NPCs, and piece together the fragments of the story themselves. This leads to players being creative and creating their own interpretations of the storyline. There's nobody telling you, this guy's bad, this guy's good, it's up to you to piece together the puzzle. There's actually hundreds of videos out there of people dissecting the stories of the Souls games, meaning that it's clearly a topic people are interested in, yet potentially never quite pieced together themselves, or perhaps just want to hear others' opinions and takes on. Quite frankly, I've played the Souls games for hundreds of hours, and I still couldn't tell you half the story coherently. Importantly though, I'm still somehow left with a strong impression of every character, environment, and decision the game lets me in on. This approach makes the players feel like they're part of the game world, and it enhances the overall experience while encouraging questions and discussions. If you're interested in learning more about the lore of the Soul series, Vati Vidya makes high quality content on the topic. Now of course, one of the most iconic features of the Souls games are the challenging boss battles. These battles are designed to test your skills and patience and require you to learn from your failures. Unless you're Levi Solover, in which case the boss fears you. Now each boss has a unique set of moves and weaknesses and you must adapt your playstyle accordingly. A lot of Souls players will study the boss's moveset before even attempting to fight them all their energy avoiding attacks while observing and learning patterns. These bosses often feel epic in scale and break the boundaries of what a typical enemy encounter feels like. There's a huge adrenaline rush connected to fighting a boss in these games, and these fights are often incredibly well balanced in terms of the boss feeling very powerful and strong, to the point where you're left wondering if it's even possible to beat them sometimes. This is where a lot of casual players might lose interest in a game like this, and possibly even give up. However, on the other side, it's also what keeps Souls fans so invested, as it poses a challenge not otherwise found in gaming today, while still feeling fair and doable. The satisfaction of finally defeating a tough boss after potentially spending hours and trying 10 different strategies is truly one of the most rewarding experiences in gaming, and can only really be fully understood by experiencing it yourself. 
Dark Souls features a vast array of weapons and armor, along with the ability to upgrade them. RNG plays a huge part in the addicting factor of these games, as every time you eliminate an enemy, you have the chance to receive a drop, some rarer than others. This could either be their armor, their weapon, or a consumable item. Certain mini-bosses and unique enemies have the chance to drop some really cool equipment. Some players even grind the same enemies until they finally get the cool looking weapon they wielded. A perfect example of this is the Black Knight during Dark Souls 1's early game. If you're able to kill the knight early, you have a chance to receive a really strong badass sword. It's actually around 20%. Weapons have stat requirements to wield, so you still won't be too OP immediately, but you'll have a goal to reach in terms of your levels too. These encounters can often be skipped and provide a great challenge for players looking to take a risk for a unique reward. If you prefer to keep a distance, you'll be able to find a plethora of incredible spells throughout your journey. Magic can be used to deal damage to enemies with crazy fireballs, firestorms, lightning spears, and more, or even be used to augment weapons by giving them magical effects. It can also be used for healing and temporary protective effects. You can also upgrade your weapons and armor using crafting materials found throughout the game. There's a crazy amount of weapons and armor available in the game, all with their unique visual aesthetic and different movesets. Dark Souls makes you want to try every single weapon and wear every single piece of armor. There is a reason we call it Fashion Souls. When you're not busy slaying monsters and wishing you went to spec savers so you could have spotted the bonfire you missed near the boss you died to 37 times, you'll likely encounter a variety of interesting characters. Some of these are merchants, while others might want to recruit you to their covenant. One of the coolest things about Dark Souls is that you're in full control of your actions. You can quite literally kill any NPC in the game, for better or worse. That is, if they don't beat your ass and leave you running away for the next half hour of your playthrough. But why would you want to kill any NPC you ask? Well. Lordran's a dark land, and NPCs have their own motives and objectives. Most of the time, they're helpful and thankful for your friendship. However, some NPCs, like Patches, man, I hate that guy, will try to stab you in the back as soon as they get the chance. If your intuition is telling you something is off, you could just kill them before they get the chance. However, some NPCs may give you great opportunities for loot, shop items, and more if kept alive and protected. What's so interesting about this is that you never really know right off the bat what an NPC's attentions are. You might find yourself questioning their motives until they show their true colors later on. If an NPC is evil, they won't just attack you immediately, but they will likely set a nasty trap for you to encounter in the future at a new location way after your first encounter with them. But what happens if you kill every single NPC you come across? Depending on your skill and level, you might find that difficult as they tend to be quite strong. However, all that really happens is your game becomes emptier, you will miss out on some quest lines and drops, receive other drops for killing them, and permanently close some covenants and NPC services for that cycle. That's pretty much it. Some decisions, however, have big consequences, like killing Guinevere for example. Guinevere is a friendly NPC and won't attack the player. However, if you decide to attack her regardless, you'll find that she was actually just an illusion set up by Gwendolyn in order to manipulate the player. And Orlando, the area on which she resides, will then darken and most enemies will disappear, as this too was part of the illusion. As an added consequence to your action, you'll trigger a boss fight against Dark Sun Gwendolyn. Defeating this boss will then grant you a unique soul, which you can use to create a boss weapon. This choice is also one that impacts your path forward toward one of the game's multiple endings. Now I could talk about Dark Souls for hours, but the bottom line is that this is one of the most memorable gaming experiences I have had, probably ever. If you haven't already, I highly recommend checking out the series. You have a tough time getting into the first as it is quite dated, give Dark Souls 3 a try and go from there. Thank you so much for watching, subscribe if you haven't already, praise the sun, and enjoy the rest of your day.